Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name's Steve Tucker. I'm from the, um, I should say, the NI group of, uh, or the NI group, AWR group of NI. So we get that one out of the way. Everybody knows we're part of NI. Um, my presentation this afternoon's on the system level. Um, it's going to talk about um, some of the new uh, features that Malcolm mentioned, pr specifically phased array. And so it's it's quite a mouthful, the title actually. Um, Transceiver module and multi-element phased array design for 5G. Um, one thing I won't talk about so much is some of the other things we're doing with 5G. We do have some exploration libraries looking at some of the new signals like generalized FDM, GFDM, which has got a high peak to average ratio compared to FDM. So we're trying to position ourselves to have some early um, signals available that will also be linked to LabVIEW and the instrumentation. But the prime focus of my presentation today is really to look at the new capabilities we have um, associated with the phased array library in, in VSS. Bit of background, um, we're, we're, we're kind of heading towards 5G. I've only just about got 4G on my phone at the moment and it's usually not that great. Um, but it, it seems as though, it's sort of looking back every 10 years, there's been a, a, a kind of platform shift, all kind of under the inauguration of the 3GPP standards committees. Um, a lot of it's been driven by the need to move from voice to increase the amount of data and different applications have come along. Um, texting kind of got in there in the way, but sort of mobile internet really became um, prevalent with the sort of LTE um, three and a half, 3G, HSDPA. And 5G is continuing the trend. You, you can see the timeline um, around about 2020. Um, the idea is that the latency of the network will have to be reduced. And there'll be a lot more data throughput leading to some new and novel applications, a lot of it around real time. So um, there's a lot of work going on to try and um, improve the latency of the radio network. And of course, massive throughput increases. The challenge is we have limited spectrum, so we need some extra help um, to make all this possible. Um, pretty ambitious goals, uh, a thousand times increase in network capacity. Um, that, that worldwide, there could be 10, 100 billion mobile devices connected into this network and they've all got to work together. Data rates downlink of the order of 10 uh, gigabits per second with low latency and um, a wide range of class of service requirements and, and this means that you know you have to work with stationary and very highly mobile um, uh, radio links with um, highly controlled throughput and delay dropping down into the millisecond region and all this is supposed to be deployed going on from 2020. So there, there are some enabling technologies to help to get to this sort of throughput increase and uh, all working together, they all provide part of the story in order to get um, this higher data rate. The first is there will be some more spectrum available, so there will be some spectrum that's freed up and the cells will be, there'll be more of them and much smaller, which provides much better handoff capabilities. Some of the interesting things will be in terms of the development of the base stations where uh, there'll be a lot of DSP and smarts going into the base station to provide really intelligent um, directive antennas that are beaming the power just very selectively to the users within the cell. So what you're going to do by that means is to reduce the requirements on the mobile to withstand high levels of interference. By putting more complexity in the base station, we can make a simpler mobile, is the theory. Those first three are all supposed to give us a, a 10x improvement. Okay, so if you take the 10 by 10 by 10, you get to this thousand times increase in capacity. And it'll be interesting to see how much of that actually happens in practice when, when some trials start to go out there. The other side of the coin is everybody wants a, a phone. Well, these days they don't want smaller phones. They want bigger ones to get the bigger screens. But you, you kind of, you've got multiple radios on the phone and more and more requirements for you know, streaming, um, real-time entertainment. It's really important to get high efficiency in the phone. So things like um, DPD and envelope tracking into the mobile with highly integrated solutions and better battery technology to try and increase the, the talk time and the standby time of the phones. There'll be some of the challenges um, from the point of view of the handset. Uh, 
as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the antennas, um, the high directivity of the antennas, that is really going to come down to beamforming techniques, intelligently steering um, the beams to avoid interference, and that means uh, highly massive mobile or MIMO techniques um, to realise the antennas. So uh, this idea, uh, MIMO will be mandatory uh, in, in, in 5G, um, and so um, it's going to help to provide the increase in capacity that's required. The idea is to pinpoint and steer base station beams to specific users in the cell simultaneously to reduce the interference from, from neighbouring users, th their signals. Um, it, there's a large number of antenna elements and it, these, th these phased arrays will have to be very intelligently steered and simplified um, user equipment hopefully will be, um, and reduced cost will be some of the benefits of that. So from our point of view, in, in V12, we've got a phased array capability. It's been in there for a while, but we've been improving it along with our uh, exploration libraries for 5G to provide a platform to start to, to look at some of these technologies. What we wanted to be able to do was have a behavioral model that will allow us to simulate quickly a very large phased array, but still provide a good level of realism in terms of looking at coupling effects, the effects of uh, individual cells that might have reduced performance, what effect will that have on the overall array beam width. And we also want to have a good RF platform, but also to uh, handle the algorithms. So we want to dynamically be able to steer these beams on the phased array by manipulating uh, the baseband processing that drives the phased array. The gains and the phases of all these elements will be controlled by an algorithm. So that was our goals in, in setting up this library. Um, in terms of the characterization of RF links, um, we provide the ability, if you think about it in terms of TR modules feeding the um, phased array, we provide the capability to evaluate the effects of hardware impairments there. Um, in the centre of the array, you're going to illuminate them quite heavily, whereas there's going to be a taper to the edge of the array. So it's really the central array elements. They might suffer from some, uh, there could be some compression. And the coupling will be asymmetric on the outer elements, and so that will distort the, um, the, the actual b uh, beam patterns, whereas there'll be more or less symmetric coupling, but a different coupling in the middle of the array due to symmetry. So we want to be able to evaluate those effects as part of this behavioural system simulation. So I, I guess some of you are familiar with VSS, maybe more familiar with Microwave Office. The next couple of slides are just a, uh, I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. It's just a, an overview of VSS. I won't go into great detail. But VSS is a block diagram simulator, black boxes for different RF blocks. You don't go into detail. The idea is you're trying to get the specifications of these blocks and build up a complete system. So to that end, it's got two real mo modes of operation. One is in the time domain where you do a complete end-to-end -end simulation with all the DSP, the RF, and the propagation links. In that mode, you pass down modulated signals and you look for the RF impairments and the DSP algorithms. And the quality factors will be looking at things like coded bit error rate um, on the receiver, and if you're looking at the transmitter, the EVM, and the ACPR. Now, VSS is a system simulator with blocks, but it also has links to Microwave Office, so you can bring up your circuit level designs, including the amplifiers, and embed them in the system to see what effect those non-ideal blocks will have when you feed the, uh, you know, quite complex modulation through them. Things like peak to average ratio will affect the ACPR if you're looking at OFDM signals. There's a second um, mode, which is frequency domain, and in that, in frequency domain, I like to think of it as Excel on steroids. Basically, the sort of thing you do with cascaded noise figure and gain, we can do that within VSS, but it takes into account things like noise, nonlinear interaction between various blocks, and it also propagates image noise if you're looking at things like low IF receivers. So budget analysis is one side where you can look at things like the contribution of each block to the overall cascaded noise figure. You can do um, swept analysis, yield analysis, and uh, sensitivity analysis on all of that, of course. The other capability is spur analysis, and the, the idea there is we look at a, an architecture and we try to predict and tell you what, where all the spurs are coming from, which elements are creating them, what the levels are, so you've got some chance to try and mitigate that and improve the performance of the system, and you get an overall view. 
So there's two things. Time domain simulation is really for end-to-end -end and looking at the modulation bandwidth of a system and, if you like, the modulation quality and throughput. And then frequency domain gives you an idea of looking at a broadband approach to the system in the frequency domain to look at all the spurs of that architecture. It's seamlessly integrated with Microwave Office and, it, importantly, it links to other tools. So if, you're, if your colleagues who are doing baseband algorithms are using MATLAB, we can link that in. LabVIEW and linking to hardware, we can link that in too. And if you're a C coder or a C++ coder, there's a model development kit which will help you design. You can build your own models from scratch in C++ if you have those skills. So it's quite an open system and people, um, lots of different teams do the algorithms separately and then they implant them into the RF system in order to look at the complete performance of their, of their system and link. We also support hardware in loop. By that I mean that um, you can generate uh, a signal in the simulator, download it to um, a vector signal generator, capture it back on an analyzer after going through a duct, and then re-simulate to do the uh, demodulation algorithms. So you could, for example, look at the bit error rate of a system with a real RF hardware duct on the bench and see what effect the noise figure has, for example, that sort of thing. I guess importantly, um, of course, we link to our parent company's tools, um, NI, through um, VXI and PXI, but we are completely open. So we have a, a product called TestWave, which will link to any manufacturer's hardware, so you're not limited to one set of hardware, which I think is an important point. BSS has three different types of blocks. Um, there are behavioral ones, which are black boxes. So if you think about an amplifier, um, you might want to just put down the gain, the noise figure, and the IP3. You can then drop that amp in and see what effect it has on the system. There are file-based blocks where you can read in measured data. So, for example, you could read in the file-based information for a mixer, including all the spurs, and vendors actually provide those on their websites, and we can link to their data and read them into the tool. And there's also circuit simulation-based. So you've designed a circuit in Microwave Office, you can link that into the uh, system simulator and run a co-simulation. So th that's all I'm going to say on the VSS overview. This just kind of diagrammatically shows that we can, bring, we can read in a wide range of data in order to build up the complete system. You can see there LabVIEW, um, MATLAB, et cetera, et cetera. So going back to the, the transceiver design, um, the sort of things we might want to look at um, using VSS on the transmit side would be, um, well, efficiency, power added efficiency, the power gain of the transmitter and the output power. I guess we'd also want to look at out-of-band spurs as well and make sure we're not transmitting harmonics where we shouldn't be. Um, on the receiver, we'd be interested in things like the noise figure, um, spurious free dynamic range, third order intercept. We might want to include the effects of an A to D if we're coming out of the IF and into a baseband and we can do all of that. And RF link architecture and module placement is facilitated by taking into account um, these required measurements. What we can actually do is vary some of these, given our overall system specs, to find um, uh, a combination of receiver gain, noise figure, and 2i that simultaneously meet all our specs. We can actually apply an optimizer um, to try and meet our overall goals and make some of these uh, parameters variables as targets for optimization. Okay, now we get back to phased arrays. So we have this behavioral model I'll describe in a bit more detail. It's capable of simulating large phased arrays with different architectures. And we can support different signal um, distribution schemes. These are the sort of um, manifolds that distribute the various sig signals to the array with correct phase and amplitude. We can also now, in V12, characterize individual elements. So if you've done an EM simulation on the individual radiators in the phased array, we can incorporate the 3D patterns of each array. And if you include the coupling between those events in the EM simulation, then we, we can get those coupling impairments embedded into the total pattern. It can also be frequency dependent, so you can have um, arrays where the pattern uh, is, is a parametric function of frequency. As we change the frequency of simulation, we call in a different 3D pattern. So this will enable you to, um, first of all, the obvious thing is to do a budget analysis with the array in place. We can do, if it's a satellite type of uh, thing, we could do G over T, uh, cascaded noise figure. 
We could look at sensitivity to imperfections and hardware impairments via yield analysis, for example. And then finally, we can do an end-to-end -end system analysis. So we can embed the array in a complete system, put modulated signals through it, and then check the signal quality. We're not limited to just having a wanted signal going through. We can have multiple signals of different modulation standards acting as interferers coming into the array at different impingement angles. So we could actually look at the receiver's ability to reject an interferer on a side lobe whilst we're, we're looking at our wanted signal at the reference sensitivity levels. So you can see you can build up quite complex simulations by those means. I hope your eyesight's good, um, but basically this is the fill form when you, you get the phased array. The sort of thing it's asking for are the frequencies. Um, you can set up um, an array geometry, so we've got circular and lattice geometries as well as generalized X and Y. So you can build up the geometry of your array. Um, and we can specify things like array imperfections, where we can say there's going to be a certain number of elements that might fail. What effect will that have on the far field pattern? So these are some typical geometries. Some interesting ones there, if you've got some standardized arrays where you've got multi-panels where there's a, there's a constant spacing, but then there's going to be a, a different spacing at the edges of the panels, we can incorporate um, those type of effects as well as pseudo-random arrays. And we're looking to extend the 2D geometry to 3D in future releases. Currently, it's a 2D array. So here's a, a sort of test bench um, phased array characterization. We've got a tone source. The phased array has been defined, its geometry is defined, and what we see here is an XY plot through one theta phi cut of the, and we're just sweeping all the way around the array to get the pattern. There's a couple more examples. This is a, a rectangular array with a, a Dolph Chebyshev um, gain taper on the outer elements, and you can see the, the side lobes. It's very easy then to um, steer this and uh, use it directly within a, within a system design. Here we've got a, a rectangular array with 16 by 4 elements. And what they've done is they've added an element failure with some randomized failures of some of the elements in the array. And what's happened is the side lobes have actually come up. We can examine that from different theta phi cuts to see what effect that has. And then lastly, some of the new features in V12, um, we've got improved array steering, which can be steered um, by tuning um, the element after the simulation's run. We've made it easier to include multiple signals so we can have dynamic inputs with multiple inputs coming into an array, coming at different impingement angles on the receiver. Um, and we've added individual element patterns for different uh, elements in or groups of elements in the array. So it's much more realistic in terms of having non-isotropic radiators in the array. We can model mutual coupling between element arrays. And finally, we can model individual RF link models for, for each element feeding the array through a TR module. So that's basically um, all I had. I hope I've stayed within my time. And I'll just open it up for any questions, if, if there are any.